we're very pleased uh, to have Professor Vidya Madhvan, um, who's going to give us a talk today. Um, Vidya got her, sorry, Professor Madhvan got her undergraduate degree at IIT in Chennai, uh, Chennai in India. She got her master's uh, at IIT in New Delhi. Her PhD is from Boston University. Uh, she was a postdoc at Berkeley before going back to Boston, where she was faculty at Boston College. Uh, from 2002 to 2014, and then we snatched her up, and she's been a professor here at the University of Illinois uh, since 2014. Uh, so please uh, welcome uh, Professor Martin. To the <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. So let me just stop. This is already stopped. Okay, all right, so today I'm going to talk about the world of quantum mechanics, which is my world, because many of my experiments are done at the nanoscale. So let me just start, actually. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so the first thing I want to tell you is about the quantum scale, okay? So the, what do we mean by the nanometer scale? Uh, at what length scales do quantum effects be, become important? As we all know, the world we live in is dominated by classical physics. And many of the phenomena I'm going to show you, you don't ordinarily see in the everyday world. So you have to ask the question, at what length scales do we actually begin to see these quantum phenomena? So let me just give you an idea of two kinds of length scales. One is the length scale of the universe around us, which is usually you know, in meters, millimeters, centimeters, and so on. And uh, if you want to go a little smaller, you can talk about the micron length scale. And so, for example, if you talk about microns, then this, is, this would be a part of a raindrop. And let's keep going smaller and smaller. Let's look at bacteria. They're just, you know, a few microns, and then you get viruses, okay? But what if you want to go smaller than microns? The length scale that we use to describe small objects is nanometers. Nanometers is one divided by uh, 10 followed by nine zeros, right? That's angstroms, and nanometers is one less than that. So that's the nanometer length scale. And so let's march down. So this little, black pin-sized patch is about a million nanometers. And you go down to the size of cells, that would be uh, thousands of nanometers, okay? And then you go down to um, DNA molecules, which are actually heading in the direction of length scales where quantum mechanics actually starts to become important. So by the time you get to the DNA, which is about you know, 25 angstroms or 2.5 nanometers in width, uh, quantum effects begin to be important. And of course, you march down even smaller to the scale of an atom, which is you know, 0.1 nanometers in size, and electrons, which are smaller or bigger depending on how you look at them. So th these are the length scales where quantum e effects become really, really important in general. However, today I'm going to also talk about two phenomena, superfluidity and superconductivity, where even though the basic physics comes from quantum mechanics, the effects are macroscopic. You can actually see these amazing uh, manifestations by measuring things like resistance or looking at fluid flow. Okay, so I, I do want to show you macroscopic manifestations of quantum mechanics. So essentially what I want to tell you today is that when you get to these small length scales, it's a completely different world out there. We need a completely different language to describe what's going on. And the effects are so counterintuitive that it actually takes us a while to understand and explain these things, because we can't even imagine these things sometimes. So let me give you some examples of interesting quantum phenomena. You've probably heard about many of these ideas, but I just wanted you to get a sense, okay? So let's start with a classical ball, right? <laughs> so 
excited this time. That's too loud. <laughs> okay, I reduced the volume. So what we're going to do is we're going to bounce it and trap it between two walls. And if you bounce it, uh, you know, quite hard, but not hard enough, that the height, this height, bounce height, is smaller than the height of this wall, it's never, ever going to escape. It's going to be trapped in there forever, going back and forth and back and forth. Now let's do the same thing with a quantum object. Let's take a little quantum ball, right? And then now let's trap it between two walls. And let's also give it some energy. But again, we give it an energy which is far less than the energy needed to escape. But this ball is special. It's going <laughs> to. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, this is not, this is actually true. And in fact, the instrument I'm going to tell you about today, called the scanning tunneling microscope, depends on this phenomenon for its very existence. Okay? So it's absolutely true that if you have, if you have a barrier, then a quantum particle can escape. So I just want to emphasize how strange this whole idea is by doing a classical experiment. Okay? So here's the experiment. You have a ball here, right? And you have a track. Now we know that if you want this ball to actually get past this hill, like this is a barrier, this is a hill, the only way it can do it is if it has enough kinetic energy at the bottom to actually make it all the way to the top. You've done this in everyday life before, you've seen it happen. So let me just give you an example. So let me just tell you, energy is conserved, meaning the energy at the beginning has to be equal to the energy at the end, which means that if I release it from a certain height, the ball cannot go past that height. Okay? So that's energy conservation for you. So let's see. I'm going to release it from here. Let's see if it makes it past the hill. And truth be told, it shouldn't, and it doesn't. There's also a bit of friction on this track. Okay, so it doesn't, so this is a classical ball for you. And in order to get, get it past the hill, you have to actually give it enough kinetic energy at the bottom, it's going to have to be going really fast to make it. Okay, that's a classical ball for you. But a, if this were a quantum ball, it would start out down here with very low kinetic energy, and every once in a while, it would be able to go through. That's the phenomena of tunneling. Okay? This is how weird tunneling is. Okay. Let me tell you about a few more uh, interesting quantum phenomena. Uh, in order to understand the next one, let me just uh, mention a, a few words about the, a temperature, the temperature scale. Physicists like to use the Kelvin scale. Okay? So room temperature, which is, you know, normal 32 degrees Celsius or whatever, uh, is, is, you know, the normal temperature that we all live in. So if zero degrees Celsius is pretty cold, right? And, and that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, I mean, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now let's get colder than this. We can get colder. The question is, how cold can we get? As it turns out, there is an absolute zero of temperature, right? So in, in the Kelvin scale, zero degrees Celsius is 273 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you get colder and colder, you can march all the way down to absolute zero Kelvin, which is minus 273 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius, okay? Which is 450 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's as cold as you can get, okay? So what is temperature? Temperature is an interesting concept. It's actually, it measures the average kinetic energy of a system. What is kinetic energy? It's just how fast everything is moving in a system. It's proportional to the square of the velocity. That's temperature, average kinetic energy. So you can imagine that if you were to drop the temperature of a classical object, right? So that's what this shows you. We're going to drop the temperature. And as you drop the temperature, this little ball is going to move slower and slower and slower until at absolute zero, it's going to come to a complete halt. There you go. 
that's a classical object for you. It cannot move at absolute zero. And the reason is the very definition of temperature is the average kinetic energy. If temperature is zero, this thing cannot move. But a quantum object is completely different. If you were to cool it to an absolute zero temperature, it cannot not move. A quantum particle must always move even at zero temperature. And this, this is called zero point motion, OK? All right, let's look at a couple more interesting quantum phenomena. So you can ask a simple question like, where are you? And you can say, here I am, right? So here's a classical dude. You can say, where are you? And classical particles have well-defined positions. You can ask the same question of a quantum particle. And the answer is completely different. A quantum particle can be in multiple places simultaneously. Simultaneously. It's not as though it's rocketing from here to here, here to here as a function of time. Simultaneously, it's in multiple places. OK, so here's one last quantum example. Let's say you have two particles. One is red and one is blue. You actually produce them together, right? They're happily going along together. And you ask the question, what's your color? If you ask the question of this particle, it's going to say, I'm red. It's going to say, I'm red. Yes, there it goes. And if you ask the question of this particle, it says, I'm blue. And that's great. Now let's do the same thing for quantum particles. Let's say you have two quantum particles, one red and one blue. And you ask the question, what's your color? And actually, as it turns out, the answer is not that simple. You can prepare two quantum particles in a state such that each particle can sometimes be red and sometimes be blue. This is really, really strange. But the interesting thing about this whole thing is that these two particles are entangled. So if this is red, this must be blue. If this is blue, it must, the other one must be red. This has a lot of interesting consequences. Did you have a question? Yes, you're absolutely right. The question is, won't it collapse, right, and go down to one state? Yeah, when you make a measurement. And that's exactly what I'm coming to. That's a really good question. So the question is, you prepare the particles in this so-called mixed state. And then let's say you take one of them and move, the, move it about a kilometer or a million miles from the other one. And then you make a measurement. You say, what's your color to one of these? And amazingly, if the answer is red, and then you measure the other one, it must be blue. So there's there, this, this, this strange thing, right, where these particles' properties are entangled. Uh, that's, called, uh, uh, that's called quantum entanglement, OK? And this action at resistance is a very strange idea. And, we, quantum, and people actually, even physicists, don't quite understand how this happens. But this young man is right. When you make a measurement, the wave function collapses to be either in this state or this state. But in either case, you get, if one is blue, the other is red. And if the other one is red, the other is blue. So I've talked about the fact that quantum particles can be at, uh, in multiple places simultaneously. So just let me tell you one thing. The best way to describe the physics of a quantum particle is to think of it Rather than a bunch series of particles all existing in different places, it's better to describe it as a wave. And the question is, what is this wave? The, the, the description is that this wave is a probability wave. What that means is that what it describes is it tells you at any given point what's the chance of finding a particle here. So even though the particle can be in all of these places, the chance of finding it as a function of position is not the same. It varies from position to position. So if you prepare a quantum particle in the same state, and you do hundred of, a thousand of these experiments, and you ask the question, where are you, where are you, where are you, you'll get a distribution of positions, and the shape of the distribution will look like this. Okay? 
And this is a very important concept. So in quantum mechanics, instead of talking about particles, we talk about the wave function for a particle that basically describes its probability to be in a particular place. So, so far I've talked about, yes? Would it, would it be right to think of that in 3D so that instead of just up and down, it's also Yes, out? absolutely. Absolutely. So you can easily uh, go from one dimension to two dimensions because uh, you can visualize waves on the surface of water. That's two dimensions. Usually people have a tough time thinking in three dimensions, but absolutely this wa these waves exist in three dimensions. So, so far I've talked about uh, the interesting phenomena. Uh, yeah. Did you say they exist in four dimensions? Ah, time. <laughs> the thing about quantum mechanics is time is used as a parameter. It's not, so we haven't quite merged the relativistic world with the quantum world in a very good way yet. So in all of the quantum mechanics that I do, it's, only, it's, it's a three-dimensional world with time being a parameter. Okay? But there are, we're constantly trying to push the boundaries to go into uh, you know, mathematics where you can actually use time uh, as a fourth dimension. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, so far, all the stuff I've told you is all these little examples of how quantum mechanical particles are different. But, but like I promised, sometimes all of these little interesting quantum behaviors can translate into something that you can see with your eye, a macroscopic phenomena. And two such examples are superfluidity and superconductivity. I'm going to elaborate at great length about superconductivity through the talk and towards the end. I just want to show you a brief video of superfluidity. There were more surprises ahead. In the 1930s, another strange phenomenon was observed at even lower temperatures. This rapidly evaporating liquid helium cools until at two degrees above absolute zero, a dramatic transformation takes place. Suddenly, you see that the bubbling stops and that the surface of the liquid helium is completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now, but nothing particularly is happening. Well, this, this is really one of the great phenomena in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity. Ordinarily, this container with tiny pores can hold liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. We call this kind of flow a superflow. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity. A thin film can climb walls and escape its container. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Superfluidity and superconductivity were baffling concepts for scientists. <coughs> New radical theories were needed to explain them. Okay, so that's superfluidity for you. Now, the interesting thing about superfluidity is that it's a true macroscopic manifestation of a truly quantum mechanical phenomena. If you want to write down a theory for why this works and how this works, you have to invoke quantum mechanics. There is no other way. Without quantum mechanics, you wouldn't have superfluids. The interesting thing about superfluids is that, you know, what really happens in this liquid is that the atoms pair up. I, actually, the atoms get coherent as the temperature is lower. And at very low temperatures, they form something called a Bose-Einstein condens condensate. And in that condensate, they're all talking to each other. They're in the same state. And because they're in the same state, they move together as one. 
So they cannot experience friction because they're one object. And that's, that's what a superfluid is. It's a fluid that moves without any viscosity. Okay, so how do you actually look at quantum mechanical particles, how do you visualize them, how do you look at electrons, and how do you look at atoms, how do you probe the quantum world, and the person who first thought of doing this is Richard Feynman in a very famous talk entitled that there's plenty of room at the bottom. He suggested that the world would be a very different place if you could only, not only visualize atoms and electrons, but even move them control them to your will, right? And 20 years after Richard Feynman made this very futuristic uh, you know, statement, uh, the scanning tunneling microscope was invented. So what's an STM, and how does it work, and how does it allow us to see atoms? So that's what I'll show you in the next few slides. So notice the word tunneling. And remember I told you about the, the fact that a ball can tunnel through? This microscope actually utilizes the phenomenon of tunneling uh, to make it work. Okay, so what is it? It's actually a very, very simple idea. Let's say this is the surface you'd like to look at with this very cool microscope. What you do is you bring a very uh, sharp needle. This is a needle. We call it a tip, okay? So you bring this very sharp, it's just a metal. So you take a piece of metal and you cut it, and that's your tip. Literally, that's what we do in many of our experiments. So you bring this tip very close to the surface without touching. And so remember, there are electrons here, and I'll show you that in a second. They cannot escape the solid, but because of the phenomenon of tunneling, once in a while they do, okay? And that leads to a current. So, you know, here's a very cute, uh, uh, cartoon of this. So here are electrons in a solid. Here's the tip. It's far away, so when you're really far, you cannot tunnel. You have to come closer. So let's say you bring your tip closer, and then once in a while, an electron tunnels through. And as you know, a moving electron creates an electric current. So it is this current that we measure. That's it. The only measurement we make is this electric current. And the size of this current is nanoamps. Okay, so it's really, really, it's 10 to the minus 9 amperes. It's a very, very tiny little current. And we measure this as a function of position. And with this instrument, we're able to see atoms and electrons at the nanoscale. So how does this work? Well, as it turns out, this is an atom. This is an electron cloud. If you're far away, the chances of tunneling are smaller. This is not very surprising, right? But as you get closer, the chances of tunneling are much higher. So that's, what this, that's all that is. So that means that here you have a high current, and here you're in between the atoms, so you have a low current. That's it. So what all we do is we just scan, and as we move the tip across the surface, we measure the current as a function of position. And if you were to plot that, you would see atoms. So that's, we just scan across the surface, back and forth, back and forth, line by line. We do this line by line, and then we get information line by line, and we add all of this information together to build up an image. And look at this. This is the first, each of these is a line, and these little blips are atoms. This is one of the first STMs at work, okay? Of course, our instruments today, that was a while ago, are much more sophisticated. We take great lengths to be in the basement, at low temperatures, in an acoustic room to minimize sound, or put it on vibration isolation tables to minimize vibrations. And if you do all that, you can see beautiful images, okay? And so here's an atomic resolution image of a silicon surface. Each of these little bumps is a single atom. Here is another example of an image. This is the surface of our one of our favorite metals, gold. This is very interesting. So you see a terrace, a step, another terrace, and a step, and so on. Each of these terraces is one atom thick. Okay, so it's only, you have a layer of atoms, and then you have another layer of atoms, and so on and so forth. You might notice that there are no atoms to be seen. 
You see all kinds of other things. You see these lines. There's a re this is called a herringbone reconstruction. It's in the shape of a herringbone. It's just that the surface, the atoms on the surface of gold rearrange themselves to make this reconstruction, but you can't see the individual atoms. And the reason you cannot see the individual atoms is that gold is a metal. And on metal surfaces, you have a sea of electrons, literally a sea of electrons. So when you have a sea of electrons, think of having pebbles at the bottom of the ocean and trying to look at the pebbles from the top of the ocean. All you'll see is the water. So all we see here in this image are the electrons on the top. We don't see the atoms themselves. You can see the atoms, it's not impossible. You have to just go really, really close. And it's been done, it's not a big deal. So Feynman said it would be awesome to see atoms, but he's also said it would be amazing if he could actually move these atoms to create molecules and structures. And actually you can do that with a scanning tunneling microscope. The way you do it is, let's say you have an atom on the surface, you can come close with your tip, form some kind of temporary bond between the tip and the atom. Then when you move the tip, the atom moves with it, and then you slide your tip back and you leave the atom in place, okay? So here's a surface of gold, and we've deposited little atoms on top. Each atom is a single atom of cobalt, all right? And now, if you have a lot of patients, you can take your tip and one by one move these atoms to create this beautiful quantum mechanical structure, okay? Now, if you look carefully, you see that inside the structure are ripples, right? And you might ask, what are these ripples due to? These ripples are electrons. This is proof that electrons are waves. So this, these ripples are an interference pattern of the electron waves that live on the surface of copper. So just, just because I'm going to talk about waves, let me just show you water waves. So if you will look here, you have a circular boundary, and you can create water waves in a, in a very similar fashion by creating an interference. So you generate a wave, and if you generate a wave in the center, it's going to move outwards, bounce off the boundary, get reflected, and create a standing wave, right? You can imagine that. You've seen that all the time in swimming pools, at the boundaries, you create these standing waves. So let me just do that and look at the shape. It's circular and it's symmetric about the center, okay? And that's what this is. This is a real STM image. Nothing has been done to it. By image, I mean it's a recording of the tunnel current at every single position of the surface, right, In a, along a grid. And what you see are the atoms. The color is a false color, by the way. You see the atoms, and inside, you see electron waves that are generated by the electrons that live on the surface of copper, they get scattered by these atoms at the boundary and then they create a standing wave. So now let's ask the question, what would the standing wave look like if you had, instead of a, a circle, if you had a stadium-shaped object? And you can see that if the standing wave looks kind of different. If I were to actually excite this at one of the foci of the stadium, you get one, two. There's another little focus point at the other end. So the standing wave in a stadium looks very different. And in fact, uh, here's the electron standing waves in a stadium structure, okay? So this is basically a proof that electrons <laughs> behave just like waves. Okay, now that I've told you about quantum phenomena, let me go to another macroscopic manifestation of quantum mechanics, which is superconductivity. So uh, before I talk about superconductivity, I want to talk about the idea of electrical resistance. Ah, I should turn this off. So many of you know that as electrons pass through a wire, they encounter resistance. 
And you know this because if you, uh, you know, pass a lot of current through a wire, the wire gets hot. And the reason the wire gets hot is because as the electrons are passing through, they're bouncing against the atoms in the wire, right? And so let me just illustrate the idea of resistance using this, this thing here. A voltage is just height, right? These are my electrons, okay? And these little spikes here, uh, the, they represent the atoms in a crystal. And at low voltages, it's sort of difficult for these electrons to get through because they're sort of banging. See how difficult it is? It takes them time, they're banging against these spikes, and in fact, if you kept doing this for a long time, the, uh, the spikes would start getting hot. Because every single time an, an, a ball or an electron bangs into a spike, it transmits some of it ener its energy to that spike. Okay, so, so, this, so you lose energy when you have resistance. Now, if you could increase the voltage, right? And in fact, that's exactly the same as increasing the height at which they start. It's the same thing, actually. They go faster. But they still encounter resistance. So there's always resistance. You might get them to go fast. You can, might get more and more current, but the resistance never goes away. What if you were to cool, cool the material down? So let's say you have copper, you're passing current through it. You cool it down, you can ask, how does the resistance change? Well, as it turns out, you can never get the resistance to go away. Now, this has huge consequences for many, many, many things in our everyday life. For example, as electricity is transmitted from the transformer to your home, it's transmitted through these cables, and a lot of the uh, energy of that uh, electric current is lost because of resistance, okay? So, so you, uh, normal resistors are not very good conductors, right? But a superconductor is completely different. If you cool down a superconductor below a temperature called uh, the transition temperature, the resistance goes to zero. Now, when I say zero, I really mean zero. That means electric current can travel through a superconductor without experiencing any resistance whatsoever, okay? Superconductivity was discovered in uh, basically 1911, long time ago, by, by Kamerling Onus, right? And the way superconductivity works is really, really interesting. So you might ask the question, how is it that, you know, you always have atoms, these atoms are vibrating like crazy, you can prevent them from vibrating, but then there are always impurities in the material, so these electrons are always going to bang into something or the other. How is it that they have no resistance whatsoever? It's like, it's like removing these spikes, right? How do they do that? And they do it in a very clever way. Basically, they do it by forming pairs, and not only that, they use the same thing that gives them resistance, they use that to form the pairs. So here's how it works. Let's say you have an electron. It's passing through a, a solid, right? Each of these uh, pink dots is an atom. As it's passing through, it actually, so each of these things is positively charged. The electron is negatively charged. So as it's passing through, it actually deforms the lattice a little bit, and it creates a sound wave called a phonon, okay? So when it deforms the lattice a little bit, at this position, you have a bit of extra positive charge. And, and that positive, this, this phonon that's created, this vibration, is a very slow vibration because these atoms are very heavy compared to the electron. So you have this extra positive charge in a region that lasts for a while, so other electrons are attracted to that region of positive charge. And by co-opting the crystal, this electron and this electron begin to talk to one another and this, this whole thing of talking to one another is the phenomenon of forming Cooper pairs, okay? So they form these pairs, and if at low temperatures, all of these pairs condense 
into one macroscopic state. They're all in one state, just like superfluid helium. They go into one state. And once they condense into one state, they can move together without encountering any resistance whatsoever. And that's a superconductor. OK. The most amazing thing, of course, is the theory of superconductivity was discovered right here at the University of Illinois by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer in 1957, for which they received the Nobel Prize. Okay? And just look at this date, 1957. Think about how, uh, how many years after the discovery of superconductivity. 1911 was the discovery of superconductivity. So it took more than 40 years to figure out a microscopic theory for how superconductivity works. So after I tell you, after we go to the end of the talk, remember what I said, and this is why we shouldn't give up hope, and I'll tell you what the hope is. <laughs> so here's the hope, I'll tell you a little bit. So you know, for a long time after the discovery of superconductivity, we kept discovering superconductors, but all their transition temperatures were really, really low. So the temperature below which they superconduct was like 25 Kelvin or something. 25 Kelvin is 25 degrees above absolute zero. It's useless to us, okay? It's so low that the only thing you can do is measure it in a lab. You can't do anything else with it. But amazingly, after many years, in 1986, a whole family of superconductors was discovered that superconduct at much, much higher temperatures, and therefore they're called high temperature superconductors. Unfortunately, you know, this high temperature is a physicist's way of being an op optimistic because <laughs> really even the highest temperature superconductors are actually, they, they superconduct at pretty low temperatures. <laughs> so, but the interesting thing here is, notice, nitrogen gas becomes a liquid at minus 196 Celsius, okay? Pretty cold. It's e nitrogen is everywhere. Most of the air we breathe is nitrogen. It doesn't take much to liquefy it. Therefore, if you look at these temperatures, they're all above this, right? Minus 180 is higher than minus 196. So all of these superconductors can superconduct inside liquid nitrogen, or if they're somehow cooled to liquid nitrogen temperatures. This is already amazing because now we can use these. In fact, some of you may have gone into an MRI, and MRI machines, basically the whole reason we have such high quality machines these days is because the magnet that's used in an MRI machine is a superconducting magnet. And the, the reason that's so important is think about a superconductor. Electrons can travel in a wire without having any resistance. So what these magnets do is quite amazing. They have, you need a huge current to generate a huge magnetic field. If you try to use copper, you would have so much resistance that first you would lose energy due to resistance, and the second, imagine the amount of uh, heat that would need to be taken away from the system. But if you have superconducting coils, then you start flowing electricity in these coils. First, that current, once you start it off, it's never going to stop, because it encounters no resistance, it's going to flow forever. Moreover, as it's flowing, it creates a large magnetic field because you can actually basically flow many, many amps of current through these wires. So we are already using superconductors. But we could do much more. If we could only get room temperature superconductors, you can imagine that all the cables, look at this, these are the cables that carry a certain amount of current, and if you could replace them by a, by a superconductor, it would be replaced by one of these things, okay? This would be replaced by that. Not only that, you would lose no energy as you carried current from one part of the world to the other. So you can basically carry current over long distances without any problems. I mean, this is just the beginning. You know, you talk about world energy. All your cars could be so, uh, based on superconductivity. You, exhaust fumes would not be a problem anymore. You know, we would at once solve our world energy problems and we would solve our, um, our emissions problems, right? So this is, this is the holy grail in our field. The other beautiful thing in superconductivity is something called the Meissner effect, which is 
one of my favorite things. So the Meissner effect is the ability of a superconductor to float above a magnet. So if you have, so normally like you have two magnets, if they're uh, north and south pole, they basically come together and they get stuck. If they're opposite, they sort of repel each other and they fly away, right? Uh, magnets are difficult to control. A superconductor, on the other hand, if you had a magnet here, if, if these were magnetic tracks, then you could make cars that would float above these magnetic tracks. Can you imagine how beautiful? If you did that, these cars could just move with zero resistance. You just give it a push and it would move forever. Okay? So let me just show you the Meissner effect. Okay, so I, I really want to demonstrate this. It does not work for me all the time. So you'll have to be patient. I hope, I hope to make it work. I do have people here to help me if I fail, but I really hope not to fail. Okay, so what do I have here? I have liquid nitrogen here, right? Mm. This is liquid nitrogen. It's cheap. It's easy to make. And I can throw it on the floor and create little beautiful bubbles because it's not really that expensive and that's why you're able to use superconductors these days. Not expensive compared to liquid helium. The cost of liquid helium is even larger than the cost of a gallon of gas. It's an order of magnitude larger, by the way. We use liquid helium in my lab, so I really need a lot of uh, government money to support my research. In case anybody here, NSF, DOE, anybody? Okay. So what I'm going to do is, this is a little piece of a superconductor. Actually, the superconductor is pretty tiny, but this thing in here is a foam, and the role of the foam is basically to absorb the liquid nitrogen and get it to be really, really cold. This is YBCO. It superconducts um, above 77 Kelvin, so if you cool it to 77 Kelvin, then it's going to be a superconductor. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to gently place it on top of this track, right? And like I said, if it's a real superconductor, it should float, and if I give it a push, as long as it's cold, it should go keep going forever, okay? That's the Meissner effect. So let me try to do this. Wish me luck. So here, the superconductor is going into the nitrogen. It's cooling down. You see all these bubbles? That's evidence that it's cooling down. One has to be patient because I would fail if it didn't cool down low enough. It's sort of not bubbling as much. That means it's pretty cold. So, you know, the bubbles are because the heat from the metal and the superconductor are boiling the nitrogen. Once the metal and the superconductor get to liquid nitrogen temperatures, the bubbling should stop. So I'm just waiting for the bubbling to get smaller and smaller. It's basically the nitrogen boiling. That's what the bubbles are. Uh, I think it's the metal that's now getting cold, but I think the superconductor is pretty cold now. Okay, I'm going to try it, all right? So here it goes. Let's see, let's see. Come on. Okay, I'm going to try to place it over the track. If it falls, don't, you know, don't be sad because I can put it back. <laughs> it's moving, it's moving. All right, not perfect, but not a disaster. <laughs> oh. So there it goes, my, my superconductor. It wants to reverse course, don't ask me why. I think the thing is not perfectly straight. Okay. 
So if this were a room temperature superconductor, it could float above the track. Wow, that looks really neat up there. <laughs> so it, just, it could just float above the track forever, right? And you could have cars made out of your superconductors, and life would be great. You could do all kinds of things with this thing. Let me try to get, grab it. I can give it a twirl, and it'll twirl forever, right? <laughs> Forget I said that. I think it's getting warm. Let me, let me actually put it up here. Ah, it's warm. Too bad. OK, that's the end of that. Essentially, as long as it's cold enough, see, this is why you need a room temperature superconductor. OK? All right, so as long as it's cold enough, it can float and do all kinds of crazy things. Yes? Exactly. That's terrible, right? Wouldn't it be nice if it, be, it was a superconductor now, when, when it's warm? Then, then you could actually make a car that would be floating all the time. Yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> OK. All right, so I'm almost at the end. Um, yeah, good. So I'll tell you a couple of things about the research we're doing. Yes? Oh, so for the graph where you showed all the different temperatures at which a superconductor is a superconductor, I'm guessing that was at um, atmospheric pressure at sea level? Absolutely. So isn't it another option not only to go about temperature, but also pressurized system? Very, very good question. So he's asking about <coughs> pressure, right? He's asking, why not increase the pressure, and maybe you could have a superconductor at, at uh, you know, ambient temperatures. And actually, it's true. You can increase the pressure, and you can have a superconductor that works at room temperature. But the biggest problem with that is the kind of pressure required is crazy. It can only be done, again, it can only be done in a lab. You cannot actually do it in real life. So ideally, you want to you know, stumble upon a superconductor that works at room temperature. Or you could do some re research and try to figure out which way to go. OK, so, so just a couple of things. So here is a high temperature superconductor, BISCO. And so what's my uh, microscope good for? Well, we can see the atoms. We can see the electrons. And we can ask important questions about these superconductors. One of the problems with high temperature superconductors is we actually don't understand how the Cooper pairs are formed. Remember, in those conventional superconductors, I gave you a model. The model was you know, proposed by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, and it's been verified by many, many physicists over the last few decades. So for low temperature superconductors, we have a beautiful microscopic model of superconductivity. For the high temperature superconductors, we have no such model. Therefore, we don't even have a path to making the temperatures at which they superconduct higher. So if we only could find a microscopic model for high temperature superconductivity, we would come a long way towards actually making a room temperature superconductor. So this is a, a, one of my favorite superconductors, bismuth, strontium, calcium, <coughs> copper oxide. This is an STM image. If you zoom in, you can see all the atoms. You can see the structure is pretty complicated. So over the years, we've done a huge amount of work on this high temperature superconductor. And we've understood many, many, many facets of it. I just, by, by the way, I just want to tell you, this is all STM data. So I just gave you a glimpse of what the scanning tunneling microscope can do. You can see atoms, but you can do much more. You can actually plot the behavior of electrons in this material at different energies. You can also ask the question, how do the electrons behave not only at different energies, but also at different positions? And because the scanning tunneling microscope can go from position to position with such great accuracy, you can see here that this particular superconductor is very inhomogeneous. Sometimes you have this kind of shape. Sometimes you have the blue shape. Sometimes you have the white shape. So all of these little details tell us a lot about how this superconductor behaves. And yet, we don't know the mechanism of pairing in these materials. So this is one of the things we're trying to do in my lab. And really, what we'd like to achieve in the long run is either by understanding, or sometimes this happens, 
by luckily stumbling upon a material that superconducts at room temperature, we want to achieve room temperature superconductivity. Okay, now I want to go back to, remember the video that was playing at the beginning? Uh, you might have been wondering what that was. That's a beautiful video. What it really shows you, it gives you a physical image of how superconductivity works how you have the formation of Cooper pairs in a material, how once you have these Cooper pairs, they all condense together to form the superconducting condensate where they all behave in the same way in one microscopic state. And then how when you apply a, a voltage to the superconductor, it's not the individual electrons that move, it's the Cooper pairs that move. And it's the Cooper pairs that experience traveling through a conductor without resistance, okay? And now look at this video from your new freshly, freshly knowledgeable eyes and you'll see many things that you might not have seen before. On the side here, you'll see temperature and at the bottom, you'll see some comments about what's happening, so pay attention. I have to tell you, those hats they're wearing, they're going to pair up depending upon the color of the hats. Notice the Cooper pairs are moving together. That's really cute. Haha, <laughs> that's awesome. I am at the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. I'll take questions.
comments or questions uh, from Professor Martin? I have the mic. Since normally electrons don't like each other, we know that at the low temperature, whatever it is they don't like about each other is being changed. Is there, I'm curious as to why, it, or if there's an idea why it be electron pairs, not triples, quads, or, or a multitude of electrons all working together. Yeah, they actually are, at, at the end, they do. The, the problem is that, the thing is that, electrons are, uh, this class of uh, particles called fermions. And fermions don't like to be in the same place at the same time. So if you put two identical electrons in one place, you cannot do it. Quantum mechanically, you cannot do it. Okay? So once they become pairs, they're not fermions anymore. They turn into this other class of particles called bosons. And the bosons can be in the same place at the same time. And that's how they're able to condense into this microscopic state. So it's this con conversion of electrons from single electrons, which are fermions, to pairs that are bosons. And then they condense, and then it doesn't matter. Are they still electrons when they become bosons? They are tied together, like you saw in the video. That's a very good video. The only, the only flaw in that video is that you see how the pairs stop moving. In a real superconductor, the pairs are always moving. The electrons are always moving. They remain paired up, except they're, mo they're moving all the time. But then, once they, once they are paired up, you can stop thinking of them as single electrons. You have to think of the pair as a single entity. Yeah. Will you? Uh, yeah. yeah. What's your current approach to high temperature superconductivity? Yeah, so, so there are, so we can, you know, write down a list of questions that we don't know answers to. And some of those questions uh, have to do with things like the pairing mechanism. And with STM, you can actually, uh, but not just with STM, you need many, many, many different probes to work together to give you, uh, it's like an elephant and blind men around it. Just by touching one part of the elephant, there's no way you can understand the nature of the beast. So we need many, many experiments working together to understand superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity. The problem we've had is some of the most powerful tools like STM and another tool called ARPES, they work on one class of materials, the one I showed you. And so if you want to expand your knowledge of high temperature superconductivity, you want to be able to study the same materials with all of these different probes. So one thing we'd like to do is to be able to study other materials with the STM so that we can form a sort of a big picture of what's going on. And one way to do that is to, so these single crystals, we cannot, we, they cannot be made into good STM substrates. So one thing you could do is, uh, for example, grow thin films. And then you can study those with the STM. You can actually, another thing you do, people are trying to do this, you can search the phase space. I should have put a periodic table up here. You know, there are all these elements in the periodic table you can try different combinations and see, theoretically, if it might be interesting as a superconductor, and experimentally. So you make these models, you make new compounds. Theoretically, you try to see, are they stable? And if they're stable, you go to the lab and you make this new material. And if you can make the material, you test it and you see if it's a superconductor, what temperature it superconducts at. And if you do this in a very system, in a, in a way, not systematic, because you need a little bit of luck, but you know, in an, in an informed kind of way, then you might be able to make new materials that could be superconductors. So there are many, many different approaches. Sorry, that was a long answer, but. Uh, there's a question, uh, yeah. So if you have a superconductor, it pumps out electromagnetic Yeah. Where does the energy come from? So it's not a continuous pumping. So all it does is it repels magnetic flux, but it's a static thing. It's not a like a, you know, it's not a dynamic situation, it which is, huh? It doesn't really. It doesn't, exactly. So it's not like a field that's pulsing like this, and therefore it's going to give you an electric field, and that's going to radiate an electromagnetic field. It's not like that, it's a very static. So you have start with a superconductor, magnetic field lines go through it, it gets cold, the field lines are expelled, and that's that. There was a question in the middle there. I think, I, just as a, 
Do you mind just repeating the question just over the mic? Oh, yeah, so okay. Okay. absolutely. Um, there, was some, there was a question someone had. Oh, this is a little off topic. I wanted to ask, you talked about quantum entanglement at the beginning. Yes. I noticed all of this has to do with electrons. Is entanglement when I talk about particles that are entangled with electrons, or can it be? It can be any. So the question is about entanglement, and he wants to know if if you need special particles for entanglement. And the answer is uh, no, you don't. You can entangle any two identical particles. Would that, as a follow-up question, would that phenomenon be something that could be used for, I'm thinking like Star Trek where they have like, um, what do they call it, subspace communication, where they communicate over light years almost inst instantaneously? The problem is we still have this cap. Uh, we cannot transmit information more at fa faster than the speed of light. So it's, it's a strange thing. With this entanglement, even though you know, it seems to us that these two particles ent entangle, therefore information is uh, traveling faster than the speed of light, if you actually try to make use of it, you'll find you cannot. You cannot transmit information faster than the speed of light. So that, that still holds. So the entanglement is restricted by uh, no, the entanglement is not, but transfer of information is. And people try to cook up experiments, and you'll always find that you have this barrier. I was just wondering, uh, with the superfluidity, when you showed that it was leaking out of the beaker, was the, uh, well, how, why did the conglomerate, did it tunnel as a conglomerate? That's a very good question. So she's asking about the, the superfluid in the beaker, and she's wondering if it tunneled down out of the bottom of the beaker. So the thing about superfluids is they feel no resistance to flow, right? The t pores in the ceramic are so tiny that an ordinary liquid feels a lot of resistance and can't flow through. Once it's a superfluid, the viscosity goes to zero. So literally, it's like a classical fluid with zero viscosity. It just comes through. Even if the force pours that really, really tiny, it's going to come through. There's a question right at the back. Yeah, I was curious about the uh, <coughs> bonds. So you have the SDM, and you're looking at metals, which have moves or electrons or uh, the, the, around the orbit. What happens if you're looking at an inert material which doesn't have? That's a really good question. So he's wondering if you need electrons around that are floating around like in a metal for the STM to work. And unfortunately, the answer is yes. If you have an, a real insulator, which has no electrons, then there's nothing to tunnel into. And we cannot look at those kinds of materials. So I, I guess you all heard it. Why, why are the uh, properties of classical objects at the macro scale so different from quantum mechanical? So <laughs> so um, the, the wave, uh, you know, when, when you talk about an electron as a wa wave, right? Um, I talked about wave-particle duality, right? So the electron can be thought of both as a wave as well as as a particle. What happens is when you start putting atoms together and forming larger and larger objects, the wave-like nature of these particles gets more and more suppressed. They become more and more particle-like in their behavior. And then when you go to macroscopic length scales, they basically behave like particles, more like particles, and less like waves. And this is a very sort of hand-waving kind of answer. We are, it's very hard to t draw the line between where classical mechanics ends and where quantum begins. But, but uh, there are uh, two or three things that's, there's uh, the idea of a phase, so a wave, right? Like, think of, think of a sine wave. It has a particular phase. If you keep bouncing it against something, its phase information is destroyed. And if the phase information is destroyed, it no longer behaves like a quantum particle. So that's another reason. Another thing is temperature. So temperature can 
take you from a quantum world where everything is described in terms of these beautiful waves and probabilities to the classical world where you know you can't use that anymore so there are many many ways to get from quantum to classical um, yeah sorry it's not a very good answer but it's a complicated question I think these guys have had questions for a while so. yes uh, have any of these experiments ever been performed in outer atmosphere and upper orbit uh, you know, I, I actually don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you the theoretical answer. Theoretically, there should be no difference. No difference? No. There should be no what? No difference. No difference. The question is, have, you, have people performed experiments in outer space? And the answer, the short answer is, actually, I thought of an answer for you. So I don't know if people have taken these particles to outer space, but we do simulate outer space in my lab. We pump out all the air and create a vacuum that's even better than the vacuum in outer space. And it's still quantum mechanics. I cannot easily think of it as an energy source, yeah. a superconductor. So uh, the question is, can a superconductor be used as a battery, like a source of energy? You can cook up, I guess you could cook up, mm, no, I can't think of anything. I can't think of any way to use it as a battery. I cannot, because there's no potential difference that a superconductor can generate. So no, not, not in a very simple way. But, but you know, I could think of using the magnet the superconductor as a magnet, which really requires no energy at all to maintain it as a magnet. And uh, yeah, well, I'll have to think about that. But I, I, do, I haven't you know, read up enough to answer your question. Sorry. Uh, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one it was a personal question. Uh, do you do experimental or theoretical? Experimental. He's asking if I'm an experimentalist or a theorist. I'm an experimentalist. Um, you, in the video, it talked about uh, how it could like solve greenhouse gas problems and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does it generate electricity? Isn't it just a form of moving? Yeah, that's what that's what you know. Uh, you know, that's the question. Is it because you generate electricity? Not necessarily, but maybe there's an exotic way to do that. The way to think about it is, where, why do you need, uh, you know, for example, where, where do you lose energy? Supposing you didn't ever lose energy, right? Then you could do things with a tiny bit of energy. Uh, uh, like, let's say you uh, run your computer. Right now it requires energy to run the computer. But if all the circuits in your computer were superconducting, the amount of energy you would require to run your computer would immediately drop to a very, very low value. You can say the same thing about so many aspects of our life. So en energy consumption will decrease. The energy required to transmit energy will decrease. You can, you can create frictionless tracks, so the energy required to move will go down. You don't have to use f as much fuel anymore. So everything, it's the minimization of the usage of energy that makes a superconductor so powerful. I think there's a question right at the back. Uh, can, can uh, atoms be manipulated, recuperate uh, atoms be manipulated into a small version of the superconductor? Yeah, that's a really good question. Can you make a teeny tiny little cube rate superconductor? And the answer is, yeah, you can. You can do it by uh, using techniques uh, that one of my colleagues, Nadia Mason, and many people like her use. They make little, and even Dale, Dale Van Harlingen, they make little, tiny little superconductors. But they don't do it by atomic manipulation. They do it by lithography and other modern techniques. Um, atomic manipulation is hard, but it's possible. It is possible. You just have to manipulate many different kinds of atoms. If you saw the number of kinds of atoms in 
bismuth, strontium, calcium, copper oxide. If you could move them all together in a very particular way, in layers, you get a superconductor, high temperature superconductor. So yeah, you could imagine simpler superconductors that you could make by atomic manipulation, yeah. Question. Um, have you tried performing that experiment with, uh, or has anybody, with the uh, levitating magnet in a vacuum? Because wouldn't that reduce the amount of uh, heat coming to it so it could last longer? Oh yeah, that's a good, he's asking if we do, did this in vacuum, it would last longer because the heat coming to it would be lower. Uh, the thing is that, so there are, the, way, the way you put, inject heat into a material is either by conduction, and for conduction you need to touch convection or radiation. It's not touching, so conduction is out. Convection, you know, if you don't have air, of course, that's very little. Radiation, you can't do anything about. So you have to cool everything down to minimize radiation. So yeah, vacuum helps a little bit, but basically to cut down the radiation, you have to, all the walls of a vacuum chamber would have to be brought to lower and lower temperatures. Um, back on the question for the battery, I believe there's something called superconducting magnetic energy storage, where you take in charges and store it in a superconducting magnet that has no energy decay because of, um, so unlike normal batteries where you have an energy decay Thank you. I did not know about this. So he has a potential way to store energy with uh, using superconductors. Uh, next time I give this talk, I'll read up about that before I give the talk. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Bhagwan. Thank you. Thank you.